morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. I hope uh, everybody's having a great day too of the summit. Uh, welcome to the, the, the Xanadu uh, sponsor session. Um, rather than give you a uh, you know specific product pitch or anything like that, I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you a bit about Xanadu. I think Xanadu is maybe a new company for a lot of you. Um, so I'd like to yeah give you a bit of an overview of, of what we're all about. Um, uh, with this uh, with this talk here, so Xanadu um, designs and builds full stack quantum computers based on silicon photonic chips. So unlike other approaches uh, to quantum computing that you might have heard of, ones that use supercooled atoms or trapped ions, our uh, photonic quantum computers encode information using optical modes of light. So these Q modes, uh, that's our equivalent of qubits, um, then get sent through a programmable interferometer, which is reconfigured for every measurement depending on the particular algorithm that you're running. Um, those Q modes then become entangled by passing through the interferometer. And then um, the number of photons that are remaining in each of these modes get counted uh, when the light exits the chip, and that completes your, your computation. So you know, in, in the future, when error correction, fault tolerance, and universality is achieved uh, with quantum computers, all types uh, of quantum computers, whether they be photonic or, or trapped ion or, or so forth, um, they'll give you the same you know, access to the same types of algorithms. So you know, why, why choose one over the other? Well, you know, the photonic approach maintains some really important technological advantages, in, in our opinion, over these other approaches. So, um, in one case, the, this technology, so namely integrated nanophotonics, has been developed and refined by the telecommunications industry uh, over decades now. So our chips are really easy to miniaturize and manufacture, and they offer an extremely high level of control over their stability. Another uh, important factor is that using light to encode quantum information allows us to network these computers very easily. Uh, you know, communication between two chips is as simple as linking them using a conventional fiber optic cable. And this is, this is not the case uh, in other technologies. I think finally, and most importantly, our chips operate at room temperature. They don't require any cooling, uh, which really simplifies the scaling and opens up the possibility of integrating these devices into consumer electronics in the future. So Xanadu's mission is to build quantum computers that are useful and available to people everywhere. To this end, we've uh, recently launched the Xanadu Quantum Cloud, which offers access to our hardware and simulators to anyone in the world uh, via our open source software, Strawberry Fields. So Strawberry Fields is a free cross-platform Python library for simulating and executing programs on quantum photonic hardware. Now, in addition uh, to providing an interface through Strawberry Fields to, to build and submit quantum programs for execution on photonic hardware, Strawberry Fields also implements uh, what's known as an applications layer, which basically provides high level functions um, and, and high level abstractions for solving practical problems uh, in things like graph and network optimization, uh, as well as machine learning and chemistry as well. So this really lowers the barrier uh, for getting started writing programs for these types of applications. You're not doing everything from scratch. Um, also, uh, the website, uh, strawberryfields.ai, is a fantastic resource, uh, in my opinion, to learn more about photonic quantum computing in general uh, and our hardware in particular. So, you know, if you're curious to learn more about uh, the technology sort of behind Xenadu's approach to quantum computing, I strongly suggest uh, checking out strawberryfields.ai, even if you're not going to be using the software. We also develop Penny Lane. This is the leading open source Python framework for quantum machine learning and differentiable computing. So as we heard from uh, Nathan Kaloran in his talk yesterday, uh, Penny Lane is unique among the various quantum machine learning software frameworks that are available today, like uh, TensorFlow Quantum or Tequila. Um, you know, Penny Lane is compatible with existing machine learning libraries. So this allows you to set up quantum circuits that interface with NumPy, PyTorch, and TensorFlow code, uh, which enables you to now build these hybrid architectures. So like CPU, GPU, QPU computations all in one spot. Um, and then when it comes time to actually run your quantum circuit, 
uh, you're not limited here either with Penny Lane. So Penny Lane supports uh, not only simulators as a back end to run your circuit, but also Xanadu's Photonic Hardware, uh, Kiskit and IBMQ, uh, Google CERC, Rigetti Forest, Microsoft Quantum Development Kit, and more. Um, so it, it's really a great uh, sort of one-stop shop, uh, if you will, for interfacing with other people's hardware. Uh, the Penny Lane team is also really passionate about education. They've taken great pains to develop uh, not only extensive and, in my opinion, first-rate documentation uh, for the software itself, but they've also developed in-depth video tutorials, example applications, encoded notebooks, uh, and they're always adding more. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Penny Lane is also an open source project, and uh, there's a lot of development from the user community uh, around these uh, tutorials and example uh, applications as well, um, which, is, which is something I think is really, really special. Um, if you're new to quantum machine learning, I would strongly recommend heading over to pennylane.ai to learn more about the, about the, the field of quantum machine learning. Even if you're not going to use the software, uh, just, just like with strawberry.fields.ai, uh, pennylane.ai uh, is a fantastic resource uh, for those that are looking to get started in quantum machine learning, just even if you want to learn more. Although I can say going through the tutorials, um, uh, that are provided there. If there's ever going to be, you know, a certification in quantum machine learning, I think going through uh, everything on pennylane.ai would, would uh, satisfy those requirements. Now, of course, you know, nothing that, that, that we do at Xanadu, be it hardware or software, uh, would be possible without the hard work of many talented and dedicated people. So Xanadu was founded four years ago, uh, at the end of 2016, uh, right here in Toronto. And uh, in that time, we've grown considerably. Uh, at the time uh, Xanadu started, I think we were just under 10 people. Uh, and now we have uh, well over 60 employees uh, from all over the world as well. 15 different nationalities are represented in this country. Um, and we're growing all the time. We're a venture-backed company. Uh, we closed our Series A round of funding in the summer of 2019. and. Uh, pretty much all of our funding uh, is from Canadian sources as well, which is something that we're very proud of. We really uh, you know, we take pride in being located in Toronto, being backed by, by Canada and being Canada's leading uh, quantum uh, technology company. So you know, if you're interested in working with us, uh, there are a number of avenues that you can pursue uh, towards that end. So uh, one, we talked briefly about this as well yesterday, is our residency program. So we're really excited about this. It's a brand new program that we're launching uh, next year. This is a 16-week paid summer internship for graduate and undergraduate students in physics, computer science, and engineering. Um, uh, and uh, the uh, residency program is to give these students a chance to work directly with our researchers on fundamental research topics in quantum machine learning, quantum computing, and photonics. So the program itself is going to kick off in May 2021 with a quantum machine learning boot camp uh, for the first week. And then the, uh, the remainder of the program with the specific research projects uh, with the, the different uh, mentors uh, will continue through until August. Now, the current plan is to run the residency program in person, but of course, due to the uncertainties uh, with COVID, that's not guaranteed to be the case, but we do have a backup plan to run the residency virtually if needed. So it's definitely going ahead uh, May 2021, hopefully in person, fingers crossed for that. Um, the deadline for applications to the program is December 15th. So please visit our website, uh, residency.xanadu.ai, uh, for more information about the program, about the various uh, uh, topics that you can, you can work on, the, also the different uh, advisors uh, that are part of the program. Their, uh, their profiles are listed there. Um, please check it out. I would love for you to submit an application. The program is not limited to Canadians either. It's open to students from anywhere in the world. So I strongly encourage uh, everybody to check this out and apply by December 15th. I hear a lot from people that, um, you know, they're really excited about what we're doing at Xanadu and that they'd love to get involved, but, you know, they seem to be under an impression that you have to have a PhD in quantum mechanics to work here. That is definitely not the case. I do not have a PhD in quantum mechanics. I have a PhD in nuclear physics, but that's beside the point. You do not need a PhD in, in physics to work at Xanadu. We have a ton of roles at the company that don't require any specialized knowledge of quantum mechanics. Um, 
you know, software developers for all parts of the stack, uh, front end, back end, uh, machine learning and data engineers as well, and, and business developers. Um, we, we, we have a, a wealth of roles. We are always hiring. And I can tell you firsthand that Xanadu is a fantastic company to work for. The culture is really friendly and inclusive. It's, uh, and it, you know, it's so great to work with intelligent, hardworking and supportive people that are all focused on uh, this goal of realizing the future of, of computing. So we're a rapidly growing company, as, as I mentioned earlier, please check out our careers page often for new opportunities. Uh, we're basically perpetually hiring um, and be sure to follow us on social media as well, because we do a lot of posts there when uh, new positions come up. So definitely check that out. The last thing that I want to I want to plug here is uh, QHack. So we also uh, mentioned this in Nathan's talk yesterday. But QHack is our recurring quantum machine learning hackathon. Now I say our, but this is really more of a Xanadu sanctioned event than a true Xanadu event, uh, since this was started, uh, conceived of, and is continually run by the Penny Lane team. Um, you know the the aim for QHack. It's it's not a conference. It's it's a hackathon, right? The idea is for QHack to really be a community event, not an industry event. So we do have some sponsorship, but uh, it is uh, in the form of things like quantum hardware credits or prizes, so things being donated uh, to the hackathon. Not really direct uh, sponsorship from companies. Um, all the speakers that we have at QHack are invited speakers, and they they have to give a talk on something interesting and exciting, not just a talk on their latest paper or plugging uh, a product. There is no pay to play with talks. Um, that right, it's really about the latest and greatest developments in in quantum machine learning. Um, now, of course, due to COVID, uh, this is going to be a virtual event this year, while it was in person in our offices last year in Toronto, um, which has has pros and cons. I think one of the one of the really exciting things about doing this event virtually this year is it's allowing us the opportunity to offer a wide range of experiences. So talks, but also uh, interviews, uh, panels, Q&A panels, uh, coding challenges, of course, um, but also things like like quizzes and more interactive uh, of uh, things like that and tutorials as well. Um, lots of stuff. We're just in the process of finalizing everything now. But the, the idea, again, is to have a variety of ways that you can engage with the hackathon and have something that can you know, be of benefit to people of all levels, whether you're a novice uh, who's just starting to get interested in quantum machine learning or whether you're you know, a seasoned veteran in this space. So, you know, as I mentioned, we're in the process of finalizing the speaker list and the schedule right now. Um, so please uh, visit uh, the QHack website, qhack.ai. Um, keep watching that space for updates. And again, watch uh, the social media channels, and I do and Penny Lane's social media channels for announcements uh, on this as well. And that's all I wanted to talk about today. Thank you so much. Um, happy to, to take any questions uh, that you might have uh, at this point for me. Let me just scroll back here through the chat. Ah, can the residency program be leveraged by people who have full-time jobs but are interested in learning about quantum computing? That's a great question. I know that Nathan had alluded to that fact yesterday, but I was reviewing everything today and I, I don't know if that's the case. I'm sorry that I don't have a definitive answer for that. Uh, if you send me a, a DM, uh, I will get back to you uh, definitively on, on if you're eligible. My understanding is that we're fairly flexible. Um, you know, if we, if as part of the application process, if you can make a strong case for why you're interested in, in, in being part of the residency program, uh, I'm sure we can make uh, allowances. So anyway, send me a DM and I'll confirm uh, one way or the other with you. Uh, yeah, so yes, uh, about the residency, does it have to be in person? Can it be accomplished remotely? Um, I mean, if, 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 if COVID is still raging and we're, we're locked down, uh, everyone will be doing the residency remotely. We hope that's not the case. Um, if you have special circumstances and you've been accepted, uh, but you can't travel, um, I'm sure we can, we can work around that and you could, uh, you could do the residency remotely if needed. I, it would be preferable to do it in person. I mean, you know, there's, it, there's nothing quite like, uh, 
engaging with the team one on one uh, face to face uh, for especially for something like this where it is really intensive uh, for 16 weeks, but uh, it's not an obstacle, I don't think. Uh, another question here from Alex. Are there problems outside physics where QML can do what ML can't? If QML is only used to accelerate classical ML in specific cases, could you give the most impressive example? So this is an interesting thing with QML. Quantum machine learning is still at a stage where we're really trying to, to answer that question. There's a lot of, um, what's the right way to put it? There's a lot of, um, proposals or a lot of, of ideas about where quantum machine learning could be superior to machine learning. The big obstacles right now are, of course, we don't have the hardware to really explore uh, these possibilities. Um, and it's it's just so really early days. The, there aren't so many quantum machine learning researchers really pushing this. There, there are definitely some. I would definitely recommend checking out papers by Maria Schuld. She's a uh, 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 she works with Xanadu, uh, also uh, uh, affiliated with the university, and puts out a lot of, of research on quantum machine learning. But we're still at those early days where we don't quite know yet where quantum machine learning is going to play a big role um, in terms of specific uh, uh, algorithms or, or applications or problems uh, that can be solved. Ah, so we talked about the advantages of the chips we use. What are the disadvantages? Ah, excellent, excellent point. So one of the, I mean, one of the disadvantages right now is just that we currently only have uh, eight uh, Q modes available for people, whereas other companies that have had a bit more of a head start, like like Google, uh, IBM, they have you know uh, 50 or more qubits currently available that you can work with. Um, we hope to overcome that that uh, that gap uh, in the next year. Our uh, 12 uh, Q mode device should be coming online early next year, and a 24 Q mode uh, device is also uh, on the roadmap for I think mid uh, point of next year. Um, I mean, oop, I'm hearing noises. Nope, never mind. Right. Um, I mean, other other disadvantages. So when I say that our chip doesn't require cooling, this is true. However, right now our detectors for actually measuring the photons after the calculation, those detectors do require cooling. So this is a, cur a current disadvantage of our approach. However, um, it's not insurmountable. We are currently pursuing avenues for eliminating this need for cooling and moving away uh, from those types of detectors. So in principle, this this uh, this this current disadvantage at least can also be overcome. How many qubits are our machines? So we d we don't strictly use qubits; we use Q modes. Um, I I'd recommend to check out the Strawberry Fields uh, website to 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 see the distinction. Um, our current hardware uh, that's available right now, like right now on the cloud, is eight uh, eight Q modes. And then early next year, we'll, I think it's the 12, uh, will be ready in the new year, uh, followed by 24. And time scale for qubit states uh, to be killed by decoherence. So we don't actually have issues with decoherence because we're using the modes of light and light really doesn't like to interact with anything. Um, this is another advantage uh, of our approach. So, you know, the reason that uh, uh, superconducting qubit or, or um, you know, trapped ion uh, qubit approaches uh, need, well, superconducting need, need supercooling, also with trapped ion, you, you have these decoherence effects. So you have to be very careful with, with interactions. Um, this is a strength of photonics where you don't have those, those issues. Um, that being said, uh, you know, I guess maybe the, the, the short answer is that the, the, the amount of time it takes to run any calculations with our current hardware uh, is, is much faster than any decoherence you would see with, with photons. Uh, so not, not an issue uh, uh, for us. Controllability, sorry, just the most recent controllability is actually not an issue um so again using uh nanophotonics um and you know taking advantage of these these uh, developments from the telecom industry over the last uh, several decades uh, we actually have really good control over our interferometer really all of the control comes down to controlling 
the interferometer itself as opposed to controlling the qubit. So the way that the hardware works is you set up your states with your, your modes of light and send them through the chip. And it's the configuration of the chip that actually is determining your calculation as opposed to the way you're preparing your light. So you're preparing the light the same way every time. Um, and that is a very well-controlled, well-established step. Um, the configuration of the interferometer is also very well controlled. We, we can very, very quickly completely reconfigure all of the gates in there. Um, you're basically limited by, um, uh, you're, you're using heating, for example, to change the properties of a gate. And so you're limited by maybe the thermal properties of that material, but it's still you know, well within the limits. I mean, the, uh, I'm gonna get it wrong if I, uh, say it here, but the, the frequency that we can do this at is still in the megahertz. Um, so it's not as fast as it could be, but this is also something that we have a roadmap to get faster <laughs> if needed. Oh, David's got a question. Hi, David. Um, my journey to get to work with quantum machine learning in Xanadu. Um, so yeah, um, uh, as I mentioned at the start, uh, my background is in uh, nuclear physics. Um, so I worked uh, at, uh, you know, after graduating, I worked as a postdoc uh, actually at the LHC at CERN, um, doing low energy nuclear physics experiments. Uh, I did a postdoc as well in Belgium. Um, doing, uh, uh, working with uh, drift chambers, again, low energy nuclear physics experiments, um, moved back to Canada and got into data science. So, you know, re realized that, you know, what I really liked about, about physics was doing data analysis uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, uh, managing grants and, and students, uh, since I couldn't be a postdoc forever. Uh, getting into a career where I could keep doing data analysis was, was something that was exciting to me. So I moved into data science and I started working at, at uh, Royal Bank uh, here in Toronto as a data scientist. Um, that was fantastic. I was there for uh, almost three years, um, at which point, uh, you know, I, I started talking with, with people at Xanadu. Um, uh, so Nathan, Nathan Killeran, who is, or Killeran, I always get his name wrong. I, I apologize. Nathan Killeran uh, is... Uh, a good friend of mine, we actually went to university together. So I, I uh, sort of was following uh, him as he started at Xanadu. And uh, we've been talking and Xanadu was looking to, to get into some more machine, machine learning, uh, AI uh, type of technology. So for example, internally, we actually use machine learning for a lot of our chip designs. So we use uh, neural networks to help with designing the shape of some of our waveguides. For example, we need maximum uh, uh, transmission when we're coupling uh, two components. Um, it can be very challenging to get 99.99% transmission when a person is just trying to adjust these, these parameters of the shape. But if you can train a neural network basically to adapt the shape, uh, then do simulations to measure the output and basically train the system, uh, yeah, you can use machine learning AI to come up with new shapes uh, that, that you wouldn't be able to do yourself and automate this process to make it more robust and, and generally better than a person doing it. So we do a lot of internal uh, machine learning uh, here, as well as um, you know, working with gathering uh, operational data for our cloud. I mean, it's a, it's a complex beast running a quantum computer over the cloud. There's a lot of operational data to gather to analyze. Um, as well as you know, we, we were working for a while in the last couple of years on developing uh, AI ML products as well, because as you know, as you know we're still in this, this realm of um, NISC era devices, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, where they're still not yet able to do anything really practical. You know, I, I, I would never in a high, <laughs> high stakes, in a non-academic situation, I wouldn't be relying on a quantum computer uh, to do calculations right now because they're just not capable uh, of that. So, um, but there are a lot of capabilities that we can use AI and ML for that can kind of bridge that gap. Um, so we were, we've been working on a few products in that space um, uh, as well, uh, which again is sort of where I, I fit in. Um, so, um, that's, that's maybe a very long-winded answer to a short question of how I got involved uh, with Xanadu. But as Nathan pointed out yesterday as well, and I'd like to reiterate, um, the, with quantum machine learning, the, the hard part is actually the machine learning, not the quantum. So it's, it's, it seems to be much 
more difficult for people with a pure quantum background to get into quantum machine learning than it is for people with a machine learning background to get into quantum machine learning. Um, because especially with something like Penny Lane, where a lot of the, the details of the uh, of the hardware of how this this algorithm is being run is sort of abstracted for you. Um, you're, you're more able to focus on the actual machine learning part, less on the quantum part, uh, for example. Uh, Ricardo is asking, uh, where do you see quantum computing in the next five years? Will there be clear advantages in specific use cases? Uh, which ones over classical approaches? I think in, um, in the next five years, we're going to see some breakthroughs in uh, chemistry applications, in drug discovery, um, uh, and uh, other other uh, applications for like, like like measuring vibronic spectra of molecules. Already, these the NISC era devices are pretty good at this, and I think in the next five years, as as uh, the capabilities keep growing, uh, if we don't hit you know universal fault tolerance in that time. Uh, we're going to have some really powerful devices uh, for for quantum chemistry and chemistry applications. Uh, in my opinion, these are my opinions only. Alex says, has a PhD in theoretical physics. Awesome, uh, and some postdoc experience uh, with publications on decoherence and Josephson junctions. This is it. awesome stuff. Two years experience in classical ML, no experience in QML. That's okay. Uh, absolutely, Alex. You should definitely apply. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, back background in theoretical physics. Um, uh, yeah, some ML experience. This is great. This is fantastic. I would strongly encourage you to apply, uh, Alex. Take a look at the website and see if there's um, an advisor that you might be interested in working with. I think uh, uh, who in particular. Uh, I know Nathan. Nathan is one of the advisors uh, for the program as well. So I think that'd be a perfect fit. Um, yeah, absolutely. Strongly encourage you to apply. Oh, I see that we've gone massively over time. I apologize for that. Um, sorry for keeping you from the other sessions. I got carried away. Uh, thanks again for having me. Thanks so much, TMLS, for for sponsoring or allowing us to sponsor the event and uh, for uh, for hosting us um, this week. Uh, thanks everybody. Have a great conference. Um,